warm welcome to all of you here. Uh, uh, a special welcome to Professor Hart. Uh, really uh, honored and privileged to have you in our midst. Without much ado, let me begin with, with actually a question that's been on my mind for some time now. It's more stems out of my curiosity than anything else. Uh, the public perception of an economist is that he is a person who tends to complicate things. <laughs> That's not to say that lawyers are anything different. And I've also been told that it is when an economist, an accountant and a lawyer decided to gamble that the stock market was born. Now, what I'm curious about is how did this economist stray into the field of contract theory, what is it, 35, 36 years ago? At least. Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Well, first of all, can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I think the public perception is entirely wrong. <laughs> uh, I mean, the whole purpose of economics, uh, certainly economic theory, which is what I do, is to try to understand things at a very basic level. So you're always taking a very complicated situation and you're stripping away all the stuff that isn't really crucial until you're down to the bare essentials. Uh, and that's, and then, then maybe you understand it. That's what we try to do. So I, I must disagree with you about that. Uh, understand. That, that doesn't get at how I became interested in contract theory. Um, I would say it's quite a long process, and um, I won't bore you with all the details, but basically, um, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I was already interested in the behavior of firms, and what, what, should, what should they maximize, this kind of thing. And um, I originally assumed that they would do what the shareholders wanted. At some point, um, along with quite a few other economists, uh, I realized that um, managers might have different preferences, and so um, maybe the shareholders should put the management on some sort of incentive scheme. So that's an example of a contract and an attempt to align people's interests. Um, and then later on, I got interested, and this was uh, about 1983, in trying to understand better a classic question in economics, which is the make or buy decision. What's the difference between um, a firm writing a contract with another firm um, versus doing the whole transaction inside itself? Oh, if you like, the first firm buying the second firm and then and doing the whole transaction within a single entity. And it really boils down, I realized when I was working with co authors, that it comes down to. The, 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 the fact that the contractual solution, so doing it between two separate firms, doesn't always work perfectly. And why is that? It's because it's hard to write a really good contract. Uh, specifically, all contracts are incomplete. Oh, sorry, not all. Uh, in many situations. So it had to do with the contractual incompleteness. And the, the reason firm A might purchase firm B rather than writing an arm's length contract with firm B was because the contract that it would write was incomplete. So I got interested in incomplete contracts. And then I just spent, uh, it turns out to be a harder nut to crack than I ever realized. Yeah. And I've spent, I didn't expect in 1983 to still be working on it now, but I am. Good. Your, uh, the incomplete contracts which you which yes. got you interested in yes. this. You start with the basic presumption that uh, there is, I mean, it's impossible to foresee all the possible eventualities in a long-term contract. Is that, is that uh, necessarily true of all contracts? No, that's why I, 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 I checked myself a minute ago. It's not, I don't think, or to put it another way, if, if um, all contracts are incomplete, it doesn't matter a lot of the time because basically you can foresee pretty well what's going to happen during the course of the transaction. I mean, the most trivial example would be, you know, you go into a store and you buy something. There's a contract there. 
and it's pretty straightforward and uh, sometimes it's just I pay the money and they hand over the good. Could be a cup of coffee, I drink it and it's over. Uh, there's no serious, uh, unless I spill it on myself and burn myself, as happened God for famously with McDonald's and then there was a lawsuit or something. Um, but, you know, 99.99% .99 of the time, uh, there's, there's no serious thing people there. say. But as soon as you talk about, if you, the, the sort of situations I was interested in, which is firm a, a, you know, a power plant needing coal for the next 30, 50 years, and, and locating next to a coal mine and trying to write a contract for that length of time. That's going to be incomplete because who knows what the world is going to look like in 30 or 50 years' time. Um, those are the ones I'm interested in. So it's, it's essentially long-term contract, yes. which, uh, which spread over, say, possible uh, upwards of five years, ten years, and uh, where you know policy decisions or policy changes that can happen can. Uh, the world, the world can change, and you may need uh, the buyer may need a, a somewhat different service or good from the seller. The seller's costs may have risen in a way that was unanticipated, this kind of thing. Now, in, your, in your paper you call that uh, the hold-up situation or the, or the shading uh, uh, opportunities. Yeah. Now, what what is the solution that you come up with? Because um, I mean, hold-up situations are not uncommon in, in these long-term contracts, um, as you rightly said. Hold-up. Hold-up, hold-up situations. And uh, you do have uh, situations which force the other contracting party to actually uh, resort to what you call shading. What is the solution that you that you uh, suggest in the paper? Because you, you talked about allocation of uh, assets, etc. Yeah. So, in the, let me say, by the way, that lawyers, uh, you know, I'm speaking, I think, to an audience uh, composed mainly of lawyers, and uh, contractual incompleteness is second nature to lawyers, I think, because, uh, you know, whenever you have a breach of contract, uh, well, not a breach, whenever you have a contractual dispute, uh, many, often it's because there was some ambiguity in the contract and one person interprets it one way and the other person another way. That's an example of incompleteness. Incompleteness could be, it can refer to the fact that things are left out, it can also refer to the fact that the contract isn't completely clear in this situation, the situation that's arisen. Anyway, it's that I think economists have not realized that this is the way to understand a lot of things like the boundaries of the firm and a bunch of other things. Now, in my early work, I focused on the hold-up and this is the, the idea that uh, if I have an incomplete contract with you, you later on, when some, something happens that is outside the contract uh, and we need to renegotiate it to revise it in some way, um, you could be very uh, opportunistic because I'm very dependent on you at that stage. You can take advantage of me by, uh, in the renegotiation, asking for a much higher price for a change of service, let's say, that kind of thing. One way I can, so in my early work, I uh, analyzed one way I can protect myself against that, which is to buy your company, buy the assets you work with um, at an earlier stage, you know, before we start, so that you become an employee, the assets are mine, you're working with my assets. Now, later, if I need a change of service, um, your hold-up power is, is very, is much reduced, perhaps to zero, because all you can do at that point is to hold me up through your human capital. Because, you know, if I need a change of service and you try to deny it to me or ask for a much higher price, I can just fire you and hire another worker or manager. Whereas if, you were a separate entity, you own the assets you were working with, um, I would have to replace both you and the assets, which is much harder. So one way to, that I can prevent, protect myself from hold up is to acquire assets. But actually in that earlier work I also argued that uh, when I become more powerful in the relationship by acquiring the assets, you become less powerful because now you are much more vulnerable. 
therefore I, I, I don't therefore have the incentive to. You don't have the incentive to innovate, and so it's not, um, you know, it, it, it's heads and it, it's a trade-off. Now in my more recent work, but I at some point having worked sort of focused on that for years. You, um, then, you, then, you then moved on to yes. uh, property rights. No, that was property rights. That was property. That, that's acquiring the assets. So then you moved on to the, the shading stuff. The shading stuff. Yeah, yeah, I moved on to a more behavioral um, theory of what's wrong with incomplete contracts. So the, the idea that, uh, although you said hold up, happens, uh, I've come to the conclusion it's a bit <coughs> extreme. Hold up behavior where you, you know, I, I contracted for a particular kind of coal from you and the, the power plant, you're the coal mine. It's a rather old fashioned example, but I'm going to use it anyway. And now I need a different type of coal, and you uh, force me to pay a much higher price in the renegotiation because I don't have good outside options at that point. I'm located right next to you. Um, that is fairly extreme behavior, I think. I don't know what you as lawyers think, but um, it's sort of pretty. It's very opportunistic, and I'm not sure it's a typical thing that happens. And so, um, in my work over the last 10 years, I've sort of focused on a less extreme form of opportunity, which I call shading. So this happens with an incomplete contract. When we get to a situation, let's say five years into the relationship, um, and uh, I can, I'll give an example a bit later, but um, where, Something happens, the world changes, but we have to adjust the contract. And we may have different views about what a fair or reasonable adjustment is. And after we've agreed on something, it may still be the case that one or both of us feels a bit dissatisfied with what we've agreed to. Because I thought it was fair for you know me to get a higher price, you thought it was fair for the price to be lower than it is. And so neither of us is quite happy with what's happened. And the idea, of, uh, what, what the idea of the theory is that when people are unhappy or aggrieved, that's the term I use, um, again, this is, with a, this is with John Moore, the person who made the ridiculous statement. Um, I now realize, or supporting, I, I now realize, you know, people talk about the fact that trust in the media has gone down. I, and I realize it must have started at that moment when the BBC made that statement about me. And I think John, John Moore uh, repeated it in jest. He was joking. He has a very good sense of humor. Um, but anyway, uh, how did we... Oh yes, well some of this work is with him. Um, and um, the idea is that then when we are aggrieved, we are not as sort of well disposed towards the other party as the relationship continues, and we're not going to be as cooperative, so somehow the relationship is soured, and that's going to lead to some inefficiencies, and um, that this is a major problem, and the question then is, what can you do about this? And in some very recent work I, with, with the practitioners, um, I've argued that maybe there is something you can do about it. So, the, uh, now having identified these problems, and you say that uh, there can be the situation of hold up or uh, disincentivization for the other party and therefore he may uh, resort to shading etc. Yes. What, is the, what is the solution that you have? Are you, are you saying that we have to actually incorporate these things into the contract at the time, assuming that there would be inevitably a hold up situation? You, well, you, I, I, I don't want to say hold up anymore okay. because hold up is, is like you are really taking advantage of me. And I want to, I'm more interested in something a little less extreme where each, each of us should recognize that for the relationship to work well, we have to both be sort of happy with the way things are going. And that includes any renegotiation of the contract which is arising because the initial contract was incomplete. So we should realize this is going to happen. And we want to make sure that people are on the same page and they feel the other party's behaving reasonably. That's the way to um, maximize the, cha the, the chances of a good relationship. 
So that, that's where you come into the, the relational contract. Yes. That's where I guess. Now, uh, in, the, in the when you when you talk about relation contracts, you you say that the in order to continue the relationship between the contracting parties um, for a, for the period of the contract more, if they want to continue uh, interacting with each other, you you talk about guiding principles, six of them, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And um, are those to be incorporated in the contract right yes. at the outset, uh, yes. so that? Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's only then that they would be guiding them. Well, um, yeah, can I say a little more about yes. the... Uh, so, what happened, which was kind of interesting, is at some point, I was doing this theoretical work on uh, the fact that it, it, if people didn't feel well treated, they would cut back on performance, which I, I call shading, and this would be inefficient. And... Um, Okay, so I was, I was sort of pointing it out and this out as a problem. And I then encountered uh, a practitioner, a, a Swedish lawyer, David Friedlinger. And my theoretical, when he discovered my theoretical work, it sort of resonated with him and provided some sort of foundation of what he was doing in practice, which was to um, advise his clients, because he spent his day job is uh, advising people how to write contracts. And he was advising, advising his clients to, um, I'm going to use my language, but to accept that contracts are incomplete. And instead of trying to put more and more clauses into a contract in order to make it as complete as possible, which he thought would never succeed because there's always stuff missing, um, rather to uh, accepting completeness and supplement the contract with some guide principles that the parties agreed to adopt um, about how to fill out the contract later on when these unexpected things happen. So if you like, it's how to, how to renegotiate when the time comes, if the time comes. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes things are kind of smooth and you don't have to do anything. But if you do have to do something, um, here's how we're going to go about it. And um, so he and his and various uh, colleagues, um, including some of the University of Tennessee, um, were advising clients to adopt six guiding principles. So these guiding principles didn't come from me, they came from him. Through, and, and he was finding that they, they work. And the guiding principles, and I, uh, when I gave the talk, either yesterday or the day before, I can't remember. I couldn't, I can only remember five out of the six, and I think this could happen again, because uh, I forgot to check. But they are things like loyalty, equity, honesty, honesty equity. integrity, autonomy, and something else. But whatever works. Well, whatever works. Yes, whatever. Anyway, they have these principles. Next time I'm going to check it. Um, they have these principles and um, they fit it in then with the way I was thinking about it and we, we teamed up and we've written one or, or sort of one or two papers together. Um, but anyway, the idea is then that if we, and I can talk about a case where it worked, we have a number, that it's been tried in 50 seconds, uh, 57 cases of companies, some of them are big companies that you've heard of, um, Dell, FedEx, um, the Canadian government are, are parties to, the, to these contracts. Um, uh, the, 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 the Canadian government, uh, that's the one which worked with the hospital? Yes, I, 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 I will say a bit yeah. more about this if yeah. you like. Yeah. Um, and so my colleagues on the practitioner side, Friedlinger and um, Kate Vitasek from the University of Tennessee, um, claim that it works in practice. So the, the idea is that the parties agree to these principles in the initial contract, and it's part of the formal contract. They actually think that this could be legally enforceable, and I'd be interested in your views on this. I'm less sure about that, and I'm less sure that it's important that it, it could be enforced by a judge, these principles, 
the other part of the contract, of course, could. I just want to emphasize, it's not that you give up on the standard. You, you have a basic contract with a lot of important things in it, like the pri how prices are going to be determined and you know what the nature of the work is, this kind of thing. But then it's really about revisions that you've agreed to use these principles. And the idea is, so when, when it's time to renegotiate, I've agreed to be equitable. And they spell out what these principles are. It's important also um, to note that it's not just that we write them in. We talk about what they mean. Um, they're all norms, by the way. They're all things that people are familiar with. You know, loyalty, we know what that means. It's fair, not a fair, 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 fairness, fairness is one of the things. Fairness is one of the things that... And, but it says in, in, in uh, the, the case I'm, I will say a few more words about, they define what they mean by fairness, and they say, we don't mean that necessarily we each get the same. Because, you know, sometimes, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this a bit, but sometimes maybe a particular outcome has come about because I did a great job. And then it's, re it's fair that I should get more, and that's allowed for. Um, so they, they talk about what these principles mean in the context of the transaction. Another important thing that this approach is, uh, it's called vested, and it, is, it involves a lot of communication, and it involves us sitting down at the beginning and talking about what we expect out of the deal. So instead of it being a kind of adversarial thing, we sort of recognize that there are gains from trade to use uh, economics jargon, there's some surplus to be divided, a pie that we can create, and we want to have the biggest pie possible and divide it in some reasonable fashion. And so um, we discuss this, and we, we discuss what each of us is trying to get out of this, to make sure that we're on the same page, we don't feel disappointed or cheated later on, and, and so on. I can, I, I'll talk about this case and you, you get a little more context. So what I gather is that uh, you, you basically incorporate these principles, uh, make it the written terms of the contract, uh, as the guiding principles. Yeah. So that you can, you can do away with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with too much of details in the contracts, because I think that's what happened between FedEx and... Uh, yeah, you, that's right. FedEx and, and Dell had a, initially a contract with tons of detail. And it just didn't work very well. That's, and all that's, these things about the supplier shall do this, the supplier shall do that. And that, so that would be the lawyer's contribution. I fear it was. So some lawyers are good. <laughs> <laughs> and they can become better. They can become better over time. I would disagree with that. <laughs> but um, talking about the relation, uh, relational contracts, I mean, you, you, you talk about the incorporation of these principles. You also suggest that uh, there must be uh, governing teams which would monitor this through the length of the contract. So you have a you have a long term contract. You you start by drafting a contract with the essential factors that must guide the relationship. You also introduce these principles, which should apply in any situation where there is a, a possibility of you know the contract being breached or an obligation being breached on account of uh, external circumstances. And once you, once you come to that stage, you have governing teams uh, represent, uh, comprising of representatives from both the contracting parties and they would sit together, apply these principles and um, sort of remove the deadlock. I mean, that, that, that's what you've... Uh, yes, I think in the, in, the, in the example, so some of, not every transaction is exact, done exactly the same way, but in the example that we, um, focus on it. In, in, so one of the papers we wrote, the three of us, David, Kate and me, um, was published in the Harvard Business Review. And we highlight this case of the Canadian government um, contracting with a group of hospitalists um, to about the treatment of people with the most serious medical conditions in Vancouver, in Canada. Hospitalists are doctors who work inside a hospital look after patients inside a hospital. And this is some, uh, tra um, this transaction is one where they started off using a standard contract 
and things worked very badly after a few years. And then um, things had kind of broken down and there was very low trust. Um, and then they heard about this alternative approach, vested, and they adopted that and things went a lot more smoothly. Now in that case, they chose, I, I think something they call it two in a box. So they agreed that um, there would be a certain number of people on the hospitalist side who would be paired with people on the Canadian government, the health authority side. And let's say, I, if I had a problem, I would know to call you. And you would have agreed to talk to me. And so we, we would sort of have these open lines of communication so that we could, you know, if there were problems coming along, we would inform the other one about it and discuss it. I'm not sure that happens in every transaction just like that, but it happened in that one. It was interesting that you mentioned the relation contracts and the formation of governing teams. What was more interesting was, uh, was the talk that you gave in Bombay the other day. And I actually uh, saw the visuals yeah. of that. Uh, where you mentioned that this could be extended to all sorts of contracts, including a contract of marriage. Yes. Well, it's maybe a bit fanciful, but I don't know. <laughs> I think it's uh, for few. We'll see whether it could. Um, the idea that in a marriage you have some guiding principles that you've agreed to. Um, let me say, by the way, that uh, and, uh, I should have said when you when we talked about enforceability. Um, I think my view is, and I think my co-authors too, that one of the, when you put it down in, in the formal contract, I mean, even if a judge is not going to enforce it, the fact that we put it down in writing, and it sort of, it kind of makes it serious, right? It's, uh, and so later on, if I feel that you are breaching one of those principles, and well, then I can show you the contract and say, well, you agreed to this. Yeah, that, that becomes and impossible. then you sort of take that to most people, not everybody. We all know there are some people in the world who don't, you know, who, who breach promises, who buy all the time. It's very common now with politicians, certain politicians. Uh, maybe it's the way forward. I hope not, because this is the opposite of what we're which will take the view that if you've agreed to do something, then um, there's a lot of pressure on you from your inside yourself to actually do it. And, and the more solemnly, you know, the more it, it, it's better to write it down so that I can show you. And in fact, I have talked to some of the people um, who who are involved in these deals because we did some interviews for the second paper. And that we heard that indeed there were cases where one side um, pointed out that they felt the other side wasn't uh, sticking to one of these principles, and it actually changed the other guy's behaviour after he, really, he or she realised, well, yeah, I shouldn't. I better rethink what I'm doing. So I think that could also be useful in marriage, but. I, I, I don't know, I'm very skeptical about I, this being used in a marriage. My wife uh, was here uh, I don't know yesterday, about, she's not here today, but uh, we haven't uh, adopted it yet. Is that a clever strategy? <laughs> <laughs> not having her here today. No, she just uh, knows, she knows it all now. No, it's just that I'm very skeptical Maybe, maybe this. She's, she's drafting the contract as well. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the Indian context, I don't know how much successful this would be in the Indian context because you talk about uh, laying down the guidelines and the uh, guiding principles the right at the outset of the marriage. You have governing teams monitoring the entire marriage. <laughs> in India that would be uh, the mother-in-laws on either side. Uh, no, no, this is not no, going no, to no, so all come <laughs> from the parties themselves. They, so that means it's just you and the other person, I think, okay. have to be the team. Now, um, since we're on this uh, relational contract, and you're saying that we have to have these guiding principles incorporated here, I'm going to take you to another subject which, you, which I know you don't like, um, and this is the smart contracts. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> the people now, always ask me about that. Yes, because uh, this is something that is thrust upon us. You know, the, this is the digital age, and we're talking about smart contracts, self-executing contracts. 
So, is, there, is it possible that we can use these principles to somehow program an algorithm which, which sort of uh, drives these smart contracts? Well, I think that my basic view is that what I'm talking about is very different. It's sort of a different world from the smart contract world because I think smart contracts um, to the extent I understand them, and I still feel very much a beginner in this area, um, are about, in a way, rather simple situations where the key issue is verifiability. Um, and I mean, an example that I use is, um, you know, if I wanted insurance against my uh, flight to Delhi, let's say, next, uh, Sunanda and I and my wife, we are flying to Delhi next Wednesday. And, um, you know, I don't ha actually have anything very important later that day, but suppose I did, and I was worried about uh, not making the meeting. Um, maybe I would want to have uh, some insurance. Um, with smart contracts, I think that would be easier to do because there would be automatic ways of verifying whether the flight was seriously delayed. Um, and then, um, I guess using Bitcoin uh, or something, we could uh, make sure that as soon as the signal came that the flight was delayed more than two hours, say, uh, a payment would automatically go from the insurance company to me. And it would all be done, it would be automated. Instead of, you know, in the old days, I would have had to provide a lot of evidence that the flight really was too and then I would have to file a claim and it would all be complicated. So, to me, that's a, in a way a very simple transaction. Um, it's not one of these long-term things. There's no incompleteness. I don't see it as having much to do with this idea that you, we want to make sure that you and I are on the same page, that we feel what's happening is fair so that we don't shade on the forwards. Things seem very different. Uh, but, can smart contracts be used for long term, uh, in the long term? Well, the problem is how do they, how are they going to solve this problem of um, unanticipated things happening? Um, I mean, I could imagine some sort of um, algorithm or a computer maybe, um, if you fed in the information of where you are, maybe the computer would up with some fair outcome. I don't know. Oh, is that possible oh, in the future? Are, are we talking about because your, your guiding principle seems to be uh, based on human emotions, which is something that, uh, uh, which is probably the only thing that the uh, machine cannot replicate. Well, that's my, that's so my, that's, that's, that's the point. But, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, sometimes having an arbitrator, uh, one of the reasons um, I think arbitration sometimes makes sense is that if you have a third party coming in and, and resolving a conflict, then maybe um, I'm not angry, you know, if I feel, well, I didn't like the outcome, I'm not angry with you, I'm angry with the arbitrator, yeah. but I can't really take it out on them, so they may, may actually be better for our relationship. At the same time, of course, the arbitrator has typically poorer information than you and I have. So if we could sort it ourselves out, out ourselves with the guiding principles, that might be better. Nice that you talk about the arbitration because that, that was going to be my next question anyway. Because, you see, uh, is this uh, formal relational contracts, can, can this be somehow in, incorporated into a, into a contract which has reached, which has reached the court? And this is something, I just want to put it out there and I want to know your views also. Because we have uh, today uh, uh, contracts, obligations breached, people come to court or people go before the arbitrator. Um, in courts as well as before arbitrators, we try to thrash out the issue by conciliation or mediation. Would it be possible to now, now that we have the warring factions before us, uh, to try and coerce them, uh, coerce is a bad word, to try and persuade them um, to, to, to somehow incorporate these principles now, in a sense, altering the terms, express terms of the contract to, to put in the guiding principles, so that 
we can steer them in the direction of you know fulfilling the respective obligations under the contract in the long term. Would that be um, feasible without no, breaching any of the principles? Yeah, it's a very interesting idea which I haven't thought about, um, but I, I'd like to think about it. Is it that they would adopt the, the principles going forward? Yeah. It's not just for this moment. No. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that would be uh, intriguing. Because uh, a possibility. Yes. Yeah, right. um, At the end of the day, we're, we're trying to save the contract yes, and, yes. and the relationship. Yes. Yes. If it is a relationship, uh, I, I do want to emphasize that this approach of the, what we call the formal relational contract, with the, the basic contract plus the guiding principles, it's not for every transaction. I mean, there are basic transactions. Because, after all, it's quite costly to have all this communication. We have to make sure, before we start, that we are, you know, that I think you're the kind of person who's going to follow these principles, and you think the same of me. Some, I, again, appealing to my co-authors, their experience, I think um, what they would say is that, um, you know, if I'm planning to outsource something, and I go, I will interview various um, potential suppliers, and I might find, you know, some of them are not going to, it's not going to work for them to do it this way. Um, so it's not, for, uh, so there's that. Uh, we have to spend some time, uh, you know, it's like uh, you know, dating or marriage or something. You have to, in, <laughs> uh, you, you interview people. And uh, maybe you don't do it quite that way for those things. But sometimes you do, right? For the arranged marriages, you do. Um, anyway, the, the point is that um, it, it's, not, uh, it's a somewhat costly process. And then once you've found someone you think you can do business with, this kind of business, then you're going to put in place these communication mechanisms, maybe the, the governance teams and all that sort of thing. Um, so there are going to be a bunch of transactions where this is all unnecessary. And you can just do it the old-fashioned way because things aren't that incomplete. And, but if it's one of the ones for which this seems appropriate, yes. Because, um, you know, there's, a, there's another area which I wanted to run through you, which is, the, uh, in India, for example, uh, when you enter into contracts with, and we're now talking about private public participation, now when, when we enter into contracts with government or governmental agencies, uh, in a country like India where there is a general uh, suspicion about what the government does when the government enters into the, the realm of contracts, we have uh, typically for, for, uh, for the government to actually award a contract to somebody they would resort to the tender process, um, which is basically contractors vying with each other just to get the opportunity to uh, contract with the government. Now, in, in that scenario, what happens is the the government actually lays bare the the basic document, the contract document. The uh, competing contractors will have access to that document, and they know exactly what they are uh, getting into. And then they would why with each other, there would be a technical bid and there would be a, uh, a financial bid and, the, and the, the best person gets the uh, contract. Now once the contract is awarded, and we are talking about a, a contract that may any for about uh, 8 to 10 years, uh, it must be a large project infrastructural contract. Now, suppose something happens midway, and now we are in complete contract. There's, there's an unforeseen event that happens. At that stage, if the parties were to renegotiate and the renegotiation ends with a beneficial provision for the government, that would be okay. But if it is beneficial to the contractor, that would not be okay because that would be viewed with suspicion uh, by the persons who competed with the uh, contractor. Can I just ask process. you, can I just interrupt for a second? How do you know, I mean, if, for example, the government says, actually, we want, we realize now that the school you're building, we need, uh, you know, some extra facilities here, you know, which we didn't expect, but something's changed, and, <clears throat> you know, they adjust the price, how does one know that that's beneficial to the government or not? I mean, they've got the extra facilities, well, but they pay more. The, 
No, it's, it's not as to whether it is more beneficial or not. If it, if it that amounts to an alteration of the terms of the contract, then we are in trouble. Um, and, uh, so that would be already a problem. Exactly. Because uh, we've, we're seeing a different thinking now in recent times, um, two or three cases in the Supreme Court in the last uh, couple of years, where there, there seems to be a shift in thinking from the traditional role of judicial review, where yeah, yeah. Uh, almost anything that the government did, which was not in the book, would be reviewed. Um, and it all stems from this distrust in the government and its uh, uh, officials. But recently, we've seen some uh, change where the Supreme Court has said that you know you should not interfere with uh, uh, you know in the ordinary, a normal tender process where the government contracts are functioning. Do not interfere. Do not uh, exercise your power of judicial review. So maybe we're seeing a change. But the larger question is: Do we um, at that stage can we effectively alter the terms of the contract? Uh, as I was saying earlier, when it comes before court be actually suggesting altering the terms of the contract by infusing these guiding principles at least for the future. Let me, one, just a clarification. Under the old system, if, say, the government did want a difference, something to be changed in the school that was being built, yeah. um, if, and they proposed, so they, there was a new contract, uh, a revision that contract to accommodate that. If a judge approved it, would it be okay? Is that what happened or it couldn't happen? Again? It hasn't happened yet, but uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will happen in the future because if the courts maintain a standoff, um, you know, a no interference approach, which yes. we, are going to, we are seeing increasingly, then maybe there's a possibility of, uh, of the court suggesting Yes, in a particular case where, where the contract has come a long way since its uh, uh, formation, where this could be... Right. I, I mean, I think the point is that if it's very difficult to... Uh, I understand uh, a situation where people don't trust the government, although I think you can way overdo that because the government... We need government, so... Uh, and uh, we shouldn't, uh, we should recognize government can do good, a lot of good. Um, but, of course, there, is, you know, there are issues of corruption and all that. So, um, I can see the, uh, the logic of, well, we have this competitive pro process initially, and, and after that, it's not competitive, so we don't want, we want to make renegotiations re very difficult. But, of course, the problem with that is that, what do you do? If you want, you know, a different kind of school, because um, uh, so what I don't know what it is. It seems like you're limiting yourself too much. So exactly. the idea, so what you're suggesting sounds attractive. My only concern would be, wouldn't the same people who distrust the government say, well, now, um, you know, they have to follow these. Both parties have to follow the guiding principles, but we don't really believe. We think the government will just be giving in on everything just as they did before. How, how can we... No, strangely, I think, uh, I mean, my, my own thoughts on this are that uh, maybe the same distrust that they have for the government, uh, which brought them to courts. Uh, now, the courts, instead of judicial review, are going to be doing a constructive exercise of actually reading in uh, into government contracts uh, after having an objective con uh, consideration of the yeah. various factors and seeing that uh, this is actually needed like your school example, suppose it, uh, it wants a different kind of school from yeah. what it contract for. Yeah. Maybe the courts can step in and uh, uh, suggest that yeah. and then read it into it. Uh, it's a thought. Well, to be thought about it, it certainly sounds intriguing. Yeah. Now, again, in, in, to get you back to the relation contracts, you, you, um, these governing teams, how would that impact the the whole cost of the contract, uh, cost to the contracting parties. Because governing teams, are, uh, I mean, the minute you put more and more uh, uh, you know, teams into the contract. Well, these are people, I think, who are already doing, it's not their full-time job, you know. Um, but, um, 
we describe how this worked in this, uh, you know, for people who are interested in a bit more detail, um, if you go to my website, Oliver Harvard at Harvard, you will find this Harvard Business Review paper called A New Approach to Contracts. And you also find another paper with Friedlinger, a, a, a more academic piece. And there are quite a few examples there. Um, and and the, the Harvard Business Review paper describes these governance teams in some more detail. I, I don't think it was um, prohibitively expensive. You know, and in fact, it, it worked very well in this case because, yeah, and we spoke, we've spoken to some of the participants who described the problems. Uh, so this was Vancouver Health Authority and the Canadian and the hospitalists. Some problems that arose before and how they couldn't solve them under the old approach, the traditional approach. And then they adopted the new approach. And of course, it wasn't the same problems that arose again. Um, but would it be worth my mentioning what these problems were? I don't know. Okay, I, think so. I mean, just to give you a little detail, because I thought it was. Because the, the, the hospital, into, you're, you're talking about the hospital. Yes, the hospital is, but I actually some of it's not in that, it's in the other page. So essentially what happened, the, the, the problem that arose was, so remember, this is the Vancouver Health Authority, um, and these doctors are working in hospitals, and they have a contract. And then there was a change in the law uh, throughout Canada. Uh, the change was that Ordinary general practitioners, that's what, do you call them that here? Yeah. Go into the hospital when their patients went into the hospital and treat the patients in the hospital. This apparently happened in Canada before. So, you know, if I was a patient of a doctor and I got ill, I went into the hospital, the doctor could come in and at least provide some services to me inside the hospital. And the law was changed um, so that that couldn't happen anymore which increased the workload on the hospitalists because, of course, now they had to do it all themselves. And this, so the contract was written before this change, didn't anticipate the change, didn't provide some possibility of extra hospitalists being hired, but not enough. So the workloads of the hospitalists went up and they got very frustrated and they, 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 were, they, were, they, were, they were stressed, extremely stressed, and they felt they were also not uh, doing a good job looking after their patients because um, they had so many patients. And so what they did, and this was a, a, what we, I think it falls in the category of shading, um, they, they, reciprocated, they, they were negatively, um, they retaliated by not admitting patients from the emergency room of the hospital into the main hospital. So that's what they had to do. Patients would initially go to the emergency room and then would go into the main hospital. But only if the hospitalist said, yes, they can come in, and they would, they just stopped doing that. They said, no, in order to keep their workloads at a manageable level. And it was kind of interesting ethically because it seemed that they were more comfortable with saying no to people than with saying yes and then not be able to treat them right. Anyway, this is what happened and the authority, the health authority was very angry and suspended some of the doctors. This was under the old contract. I think it's an example of contraction and completeness um, because this contingency of the new law was not written into the contract. And then the hospitalists thinking the other party had behaved fairly to them and reciprocated negatively. Now, um, after this happened and the trust levels really went down uh, and there was a lot of anger, but they discovered this vested approach. So they adopted that going forward and with the governance teams and people talking to each other and they now claim that things work much better. And as an example, of course we can't replay that, you know, let's have the law change again and see how they do it this time. That's not possible. But instead, um, what an example of how, where things did go better when was that there was a new, um, again another law, which said that um, doctors had to give 
some uh, assistance in dying, you know, uh, advice about how to deal with death, I guess. Is that what it was called? Um, yeah, assistance in dying. Um, and so this was a new requirement. And this was actually already being talked about when the, the, the vested contract was written, but there wasn't enough detail for it to be included in the contract. And so then it happened. And the question was how to adjust the workloads and the payments and all this in, in light of the fact that they were going to have this extra job to do. And they did it. And it, they did it well and without a lot of without conflict. And the claim was, and I've talked to the people, that they feel that this would never have happened under the old contract, that it was possible under the new contract, because they were looking at things, they'd agreed to look at things from the other person's point of view, among other things, and to talk and so on. And have, have you had any experience with the, the, the courts in the US where this sort of actually been applied in life cases? Has been enforced, you mean? No. I, no. I think there was a, there's a British case where uh, has enforced some sort of principle, not one of these, but some other principle, which is sort of in the, in the same ballpark. Um, this comes back to the question of enforcement, which, as I, I feel, is not critical. Certainly in the Hospital's case, it wasn't a judge who was forcing it. They, they just had agreed to do it, and then they did it. Can we now, uh, I think we're running a short time now, uh, any questions from the audience?